It only took 88 days from 9-11 to topple the Taliban. It was a resounding success that didn't last. I'll talk to former CIA Station Chief Robert Grenier, who directed the ground war. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. When Al-Qaeda attacked the United States on 9-11, all eyes turned to Afghanistan. The Taliban, who were sheltering and supporting the Islamist terrorist group, refused to turn them over. The CIA's station chief in Islamabad, Pakistan, at the time was Robert Grenier. He was asked to draft the U.S. war plan for Afghanistan. Things went really well. In the South, we worked with Afghans like Hamid Karzai to expel the Taliban. December 7, 2001, they were driven from their capital, Kandahar. Victory was sweet, but fleeting. Robert Grenier has written a memoir about his time in the region and back in Washington. It's called 88 Days to Kandahar. Bob, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here. What are you doing writing war plans? Why would CIA do that? Isn't that the military's job? Yeah, and I wasn't actually asked to write a war plan per se. Uh, as I recount in the book, on the 23rd of September, about 12 days after 9-11, I got a, a, a phone call from George Tenet. It was late on a Saturday night, his time, early a Sunday morning, my time. And he was preparing to go to a meeting at Camp David to meet with the other members of the War Cabinet and to talk about the strategy for Afghanistan. And what he said, in effect, was we're in big trouble. The, uh, the Pentagon is telling us that there are very few military targets of any kind in Afghanistan that can probably hit them all in a, just a matter of days. He said, we know where all the terrorist training camps are, but they're all empty. The terrorists are anticipating an American attack, and they've all fled. So basically, he said, what do we do? And he, he literally asked me, do we bomb empty camps? And so I obviously had been thinking about this a great deal. We started to talk about it. I said, look, Mr. Director, this is taking too much time. Let me write this all down. And so I did. It was sent to him. He immediately distributed it to the other members of the War Cabinet. Uh, they met that Sunday morning at Camp David, and basically and they that, approved it. that turned into the template for the war plan. Yes. What was in that? What were you saying, what were you suggesting that we do? What I was saying was that, look, this is primarily a political problem, not a military problem. We'll probably have to use military means, but at the end of the day, we'll, we're seeking a political solution. Which means get al-Qaeda and get them out of get Afghanistan. Get them out of Afghanistan, but, but just as importantly, keep them out. And unless the U.S. meant to colonize Afghanistan, we weren't going to be able to do that ourselves. Obviously, nobody was suggesting that we were going to colonize Afghanistan. So at the end of the day, I said, look, we have to build some sort of a political dispensation in Afghanistan that will not only drive out al-Qaeda, but that will keep them out, keep the country from once again becoming a safe haven for international terrorists. So everything, I said, needs to be vectored toward that. And how did the military react to CIA kind of taking the lead on a war. Well, there's no precedence for that, is there? There really isn't any precedence for that. No, there really isn't. Certainly nothing on this scale. Um, it, interestingly, I think that the, the further you rose in the military hierarchy, the greater the resistance to the idea. And the, the pinnacle of the military hierarchy, of course, was Secretary Rumsfeld. He wasn't comfortable with it. But at the end of the day, he was quite willing to accept it. And as I recount in the book, after the, this war plan, so-called, was uh, approved by the president, I immediately had a, a secure video teleconference with General Tommy Franks, the commander of Central Command, who was going to be responsible for the actual war campaign. And uh, it was quite amusing. Uh, before we actually started the meeting, he spent quite a bit of time basically grousing, saying, what on earth am I doing? I already did a, a war plan. The president thought it was pretty good. You know, and why is the secretary all of a sudden telling me I've got to go to the, to the CIA to find out what our war plan is? But in the end, he was actually quite comfortable. We, we were uh, describing for him uh, the what, not the how. So we were saying, look, these are our objectives. These are the things that, that, uh, that we suggest. Uh, this is the way we think we got to sequence our targets. Uh, we believe very strongly that it should be Afghans in the front. In, in terms of the military campaign and the U.S. supporting them in the rear. And he was actually quite comfortable with that in the end. Let's back up to before 9-11. Mm -hmm. You arrived in Islamabad, Pakistan in 1999. That's what right. was the relationship between Pakistan and the United States at that time? At that time, the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan was abysmal. Uh, like it is now, kind of. Uh, well, actually, considerably worse. Uh, it, it's improved somewhat in recent months. 
Um, but um, but it, it was it was very very bad. And the, the reason for that being that we had been cooperating with the Pakistanis very very closely during the 1980s when we were mutually trying to drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan. And in, as soon as the Soviets withdrew, we suddenly discovered that there were uh, it was under U.S. law we were forced to sanction the Pakistanis very, very heavily. Because of be their nuclear because weapons. Because of their nuclear weapons program. Now, somehow we had managed to conveniently overlook that during the decade of the 1980s. All of a sudden- Because they're helping us. Because they're helping <laughs> us. And now all of a sudden we say, well, look, look at what we're finding here. Well, I've spoken to analysts from that time who said we knew a great deal before the Soviets withdrew. We only decided to, uh, to reach that conclusion with regard to the Pakistani nuclear program after the Soviets withdrew. That was not lost on the Pakistanis, and so therefore... So they were holding a grudge against us. They were holding a very serious grudge against us. We had been cooperating with them in all sorts of different ways. We were giving them uh, lots of U.S. aid. We were selling them weapons. We had a very active uh, AID economic development program in Pakistan. All of that was zeroed out almost overnight, and the Pakistanis were extremely resentful, and therefore, uh, sort of getting to my parochial interests, they were absolutely refusing to cooperate with us against al-Qaeda. That's what I was going to ask you. Why didn't they take action against al-Qaeda? They knew where they were. They knew mm -hmm. what they were up to. Mm -hmm. The embassy bombings in Africa had happened in 1998. That's right. But they were like, this isn't our problem. You guys deal with it. That's exactly, that's exactly what it was. Now, uh, now, they were not aiding and abetting al-Qaeda. They were aiding and abetting the Taliban, who were ruling much of Afghanistan at that time. And they had a, a very uh, important national security interest in supporting the Taliban, or, or so they felt. Um, Al-Qaeda, they, they really didn't particularly care about. And there were Al-Qaeda cadres who were passing freely through Afghanistan, through Pakistan on their way to and from Afghanistan. And as far as the Pakistanis were concerned, as you say, this was our problem, not theirs. So on 9-11, it became their problem. Suddenly it became their problem, yes. Tell me first about that day, 9-11. You were in Islamabad. I was in Islamabad. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, one of my station officers uh, burst into my office and said, Chief, you, you need to turn on the, the television. And like so many other people, I could see the plume of smoke rising from you know, one of the, uh, of the Twin Towers. And then, uh, like so many others, I was actually watching on live television as the second plane hit the tower. Now, like many, at first I was hoping that this was just some terrible accident. When the second plane hit, it was clearly uh, an act of terrorism. And at the top of the list of suspects, obviously, was bin Laden and al-Qaeda. You knew right away when you saw it that that was al-Qaeda? I knew that 99 chances out of 100 it was al-Qaeda. Now, obviously, we had to set about proving that. And uh, there was a great deal of forensic work that was being done at the U.S. side, obviously taking a look at, at the passenger manifest, determining who was on that aircraft, and, uh, and determining very quickly that the, there were a number of young men who did actually have uh, links with al-Qaeda. Um, the first piece of information that we had com coming out of Afghanistan was when one of our sources was actually present when bin, bin Laden was meeting with a number of his Arab followers, and he uh, publicly took credit for uh, for the 9-11 attacks so in, in that private meeting. In those days following the attack, the United States comes out very strongly s giving the Taliban an ultimatum. Yes. Hand over bin Laden, deny sanctuary to al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. or face destruction. Yes. You were actually negotiating with the Taliban mm -hmm. during that time. Yes. What happened? Well, I had two meetings with the number two figure in, uh, in the Taliban, uh, uh, an individual by the name of Mullah Osmani. He was the, the southern zone commander. So he actually had responsibility for the troops that were controlling the Taliban capital in Kandahar. And at our first meeting, uh, he, I, it started out in a very positive way. He, he said, look, he, he said, we don't, we don't particularly care for bin Laden. And I knew that that was actually true. We, our intelligence indicated that Osmani in particular, among others in the Taliban leadership, frankly didn't like al-Qaeda or bin Laden. And there were reasons for that. They, they felt that these people were acting like a, a state within a state. They, there, was, there was a great deal of resentment on the part of uh, certain members of the, the Taliban leadership. So he said, look, this man's a problem. We don't want to see our, our country destroyed. We don't want to go to war with you. Let's find a mutual way to solve this problem. So what did you say? So I, I laid out a number of different options. I said, look, you can simply turn him over. Uh, you can hold a trial in your own courts very quickly uh, where you find him uh, guilty and decide to, to extradite him, in effect, to the United States. Or we can find some covert means uh, where you either give us the information that will enable us to go in and get him ourselves, uh, or you, you, can, you can go in and get him yourselves, turn him quietly over to us, 
Uh, we will claim that uh, we got him elsewhere as he was trying to, to flee. Any number of different ways. If you want to do this but without your fingerprints, he wasn't going for that sense. because Mullah Omar, the number one, was, I guess, very sympathetic to Al Qaeda and Bin Laden and he, just didn't want to touch him. He, at the end of the day, yes, that, that's exactly what it was. And so Osmani was coming up with all manner of excuses. And part of the reason for that was that I think he, he wasn't going to agree to anything unless his boss agreed. So he said, look, I'm willing to take your proposals to Mullah Osmani, but uh, to uh, Mullah Omar, but Mullah Omar will decide in the end. So he didn't want to expose himself politically, if you will. Um, so that we were still somewhat encouraged at that point, and we were hoping that uh, Omar would engage with us to try to find some way. So out you of actually this recommended to this guy to do a coup and to take power from Mullah Omar. Yes, that was in our second meeting. Mm -hmm. So in in the intervening days, Mullah Omar came out very publicly, and uh, despite the fact that he he had good reasons, he, he had political cover to comply with our demands. He, he refused to do it in a very public way. So it was clear that he just wasn't going to do this. And so that's why in the second meeting, I said to Osmani, look, um, OK, well, Omar has a, a personal obligation to bin Laden. You don't have that obligation. He's taking a course that is, is putting the, the Taliban on a war course with the United States. You need to save your country. You need to save the Taliban movement. You need to push him quietly aside and do what he can. And initially, he actually agreed. I mean, he, he felt that they were in a box. He, he was trying to find they some They were really way out. in a box. They were really in a box. Because they were facing destruction. They were facing destruction. Now, let's remember, the, these, these were people who'd gone through the, the, uh, the experience with the Soviet Union. They thought that perhaps they could survive. Perhaps they could defeat the United States as they had the Soviets. But frankly, that had been almost 10 years of destruction, and they didn't want to go through that again. So he was trying to find a way out. And when his bud was up, and in the course of our conversation, he said, yes, yes, I will do it. Unfortunately, as he was driving back to Kandahar, he apparently had second thoughts. So how was your relationship with Pakistan's ISI, their intelligence agency, during those days after 9-11? Well, basically, that relationship turned 180 degrees. I had been very careful to maintain links with them. We, we weren't cooperating at all. Uh, we certainly we didn't like each other. Um, I think there was a certain mutual respect. And remember, we had a long history. You know, dating back to the Cold War, the, 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 the Pakistanis had helped us a great deal against the Soviets during the, the Cold War. Obviously, we cooperated very effectively in the 1980s. That history was between the two organizations was not completely lost. And there was a certain a, amount of, of, of mutual respect, if you will. And we continued to talk to each other, even though, as a matter of policy, they wouldn't cooperate. When 9-11 happened and President Musharraf decided that he was going to side with the United States, that relationship turned 180 degrees. And suddenly, everything was on the table. There was nothing that they would refuse us, at least in those early days. But were they OK with that? I mean, given their animosity towards the United States, especially to the CIA, to share intelligence, to work with us? Their president had told him, who is also the chief of army staff, by the way, and, and the, the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, is a military organization. And uh, although some people would claim otherwise, in my experience, it's a very disciplined military organization, they follow their orders. And uh, you could tell that there were some members of the ISI who really weren't happy with the idea that suddenly they were aiding the United States in a, in a war against the Taliban. You can see it in their body English. They weren't happy, but they had orders and they followed them. You had found out that a senior Pakistani nuclear scientist had links, had talked to al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. What did he give them? What, how far along did they get? I mean, Fortunately, they didn't get very far. But we didn't know that at the outset. Uh, we knew that this was an organization called the Umar Temeri now, the UTN, that was uh, engaged supposedly in providing humanitarian services to the Afghan people and specifically to the Taliban. The senior members of this organization, uh, an individual by the name of Dr. Bashir, being the, the head of the organization, were, were Pakistani scientists. Dr. Bashir was a very eminent nuclear scientist who had played uh, a significant role in Pakistan's development of a nuclear weapon. And he was a bit of a nutter, quite frankly. Uh, and he felt that Pakistan's nuclear weapons capability needed to be shared with the rest of the Islamic world. That was not a message that was particularly welcome with us. Uh, and so there was a lot of suspicion at the outset. We knew that he was spending a lot of time before 9-11 in Afghanistan. We didn't know precisely what he was up to. And after a number of days of interrogation, which th eventually the Pakistanis were convinced to allow us to conduct, he admitted that, yes, he had met with bin Laden 
and that one of bin Laden's lieutenants had brought to them a piece of what they thought was nuclear material and wanted for the, the Pakistani scientists to identify it for them. That just set off all kinds of alarm bells back in the United States. And remember, this is just after 9-11. Everyone was terrified that this was only, maybe only the precursor to a more devastating attack. Right. And there were unsubstantiated reports mm -hmm. that there might be a nuclear weapon on its way to New York. So I, I, can't, I can't begin to convey to you the level of pressure that we were under to get to the bottom of this whole matter. And eventually, we did. We felt that we had a, a successful interrogation that included multiple polygraph examinations where we were convinced that if any sub substantive uh, uh, nuclear material or nuclear capability had been given to al-Qaeda, he didn't know about it. You know, as your book suggests, uh, the title suggests, it only took 88 days from 9-11 to the capital, Kandahar. Mm -hmm. Why, why was it so fast? Why was it so easy almost? Mm -hmm. Was it because the Taliban were um, hated and distrusted by the majority of, of the Afghan people? It, at, the end, at the end of the day, yes. So they saw it as an opportunity to get rid of these people? They did. Um, and yet there were very, very few uh, Afghans, and particularly among the, the Pashtuns. The, the, the Taliban was a, a Pashtun organization. It, the, Pashtuns being the largest ethnic group in Afghanistan. Um, there, we didn't realize it because there were very few people, uh, even among the Pashtuns, who were willing to rise up actively and try to overthrow the Taliban. Only two tribal leaders of any significance who were actually willing to do that. And so we didn't realize the depth of opposition to the Taliban. But in point of fact, although uh, most of the, the Afghans in the southern part of the country where the, the Taliban resided, were not willing to take the risks associated with actively rising up against them, they were glad to see them go. And if we didn't fully appreciate that, the Taliban did. You know, you say this in your book, you said, I had failed to understand the nature and limits of our victory over the Taliban in December 2001. What was the, the nature of that victory and what did we all fail to understand about it? Well, again, I, I don't think that we realized, it, it, it happened too, too easily. Now, it, didn't, it didn't seem all that easy at the time and it certainly didn't seem all that short. Uh, time was telescoped. Uh, two weeks seemed like an eternity you know, because we were under such pressure to do something about this problem. But um, we, I guess we didn't realize the extent to which the, first of all, the Taliban had decided to evacuate, obviously under tremendous military pressure, not only in the south, but particularly in the north, where the Northern Alliance, who had long been involved in a civil war with the Taliban, with American support, swept down and took Kabul. Um, but they realized that, that they had, they were very weak politically in the South and that the people would welcome Hamid Karzai and Gulag al-Shirzai as liberators. And therefore, it was time for them to, uh, to step aside. What we also didn't realize at the time was how, how relatively easily and, and rapidly that political dynamic could change if the, 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 the policies that were pursued by the victors alienated the people in the South, and unfortunately, that's what happened. That's what happened, because we felt like, oh, we've liberated Afghanistan, we're done, let's just rebuild the country, let's bring in democracy and um, check that off. Yes, yes, and, and in the early days, it was understandable that we would feel that way. Uh, again, the Taliban fled. It seemed that they were, uh, they completely, were, done. They were completely spent force politically, or so, so it appeared at the time. Um, Afghans themselves were really on, on best behavior. Now, remember, this was a war that had, this is a country that had been locked in a civil war for, for many years, and there had been tremendous atrocities on all sides. And for instance, we were very much afraid that when the Northern Alliance took Kabul in the north, that there would be tremendous retri retribution. They would start a wholesale massacre of Pashtuns in, uh, in Kabul. That didn't happen. And we could see among Afghans generally that there was an understanding that we must not repeat the mistakes of the past. We have an opportunity to reunify the country, uh, to establish stability, some degree of, of economic prosperity. We can't lose that opportunity. And that, so that made us who were looking at it essentially from the outside very optimistic. What was our biggest mistake after the fall of the Taliban? There are a lot of factors I think that, that uh, compete. <laughs> For, uh, for the title of biggest mistake. I would say- A lot of mistakes, you mean? <laughs> I think there were a lot of mistakes uh, that, uh, that we made and that Afghans made. I mean, at the end of the day, this is up to Afghans to rebuild their country. 
So yeah, I think we, we need to keep that very much in mind. This was not just a, a U.S. task. But I, I think that there were two key things that I would put my finger on. One is that the U.S. was very slow to uh, begin the, uh, the reconstruction of Afghanistan, the economic reconstruction of Afghanistan. We had promised them that we would come in uh, very aggressively to provide them with economic support, and we were very, very slow off the mark. And I was never really quite sure why that was. Yes, we were very much distracted very quickly with, with Iraq, but surely the, the U.S. as a global power ought to be able to do, do two things at once, and we were very, very slow uh, to do that. The other thing that, um, that I feel was a big mistake on our part was that we tried too aggressively to completely reform Afghanistan. Remember, the reason that the Taliban had risen in the first place was because Afghan warlords had been uh, fought, warring amongst themselves. And so there was a very strong and understandable desire, particularly on the part of the U.S. military, which took the lead after that after the, the supposed victory in December of 2001, that we would not repeat that history, that instead we would build up a highly centralized Afghan government with a very large Afghan army that ultimately would be able to impose its will on the country at large. That was never realistic. It was never sustainable. And as much as we were, we had good reason to distrust the warlords, in fact, what I think we ought to have done much earlier on was to try to empower the right sorts of warlords and to make them the best warlords they could be. That was not the path that we took. There's a picture in your book I want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. um, the caption says, sitting with Ghul Aga Shirzai on Mullah Omar's bed. Yes. What were you doing on that man's bed? Oh, God knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, shortly after the, the, the victory in, uh, in December of 2001, in, uh, the following month in, in January, I made a visit to, uh, to Kandahar. And it, the CIA, we were setting up a new American embassy in Kabul. The CIA was setting up an independent station. So they were going to have responsibility for Afghanistan. I was, I was supposed to wash my hands of it. So I wanted to make sure that we turned over all of our capabilities and we facilitated for our new CIA colleagues you know, their, their relationships inside of Afghanistan. So I traveled to, to Kabul and I, I met with, uh, with Gulag Shirzai, who was now the governor of, of Kandahar. And of course, he, he treated me as a, as a very important person. And uh, we toured around the city, including uh, visiting Mullah Omar's compound. And uh, they took us on a tour of the house, and we ended up being photographed sitting on Mullah Omar's bed. You uh, came back to Washington after your tour there. You were involved in the uh, Iraq War, um, and then took over the CIA's counterterrorism center. Yes. What was your involvement in the CIA's torture slash enhanced interrogation program? Well, that was something that I had invented, or uh, that I had inherited. Um, the, the program had started back in, uh, in 2002. In fact, it was in response to our capture during my tenure in Pakistan of the first senior member of al-Qaeda. They wanted to effectively interrogate this individual. This is Abu Zubaydah? Uh, Abu Zubaydah. Uh -huh. and, um, and so the, the, that, that's, that was the start of the program, and it, it built and evolved rapidly from there. Many of the abuses that came out in this uh, the Senate Democratic report actually um, occurred during those very early days when the, when the CIA was trying to build this program from nothing. By the time I came on the scene in December of 2004, it was, it was a very well-established and mature program. Whatever else you might think about it, uh, again, we, we were, the program had been thoroughly set up, it was very disciplined, and from our perspective, certainly it was very effective. It was effective because we were torturing people? It was, it was effective because we, the, the, the senior members of al-Qaeda who, who came into our hands, and there were about a little over 100 of them uh, during the, the history of the entire program. Um, and a, a majority of the people, uh, even of these, these senior terrorists, if you will, uh, gave up what they knew pretty rapidly and without our doing anything you know, more serious than what you might encounter in a police precinct in the United States. It was a minority, about 30%. Uh, who were very, very resistant and who, uh, and against whom these uh, so-called enhanced interrogation techniques were employed. And I can And did they work? Uh, in fact, in fact, they did. Uh, and again, you know, so much of the conversation about this, and we could have a very long conversation, uh, frankly, it tends to, to trivialize the issue. People tend to see it in a very mechanistic sort of way. You do, you do this and you get that. It doesn't work that way. Um, the, the relationship that an interrogator and the supporting team have with uh, someone who is being interrogated is a very deeply personal one. Uh, and uh, no two interrogations are alike. 
uh, as, as no two terrorists are entirely, entirely alike. You're, you're bringing in the full scope of an individual's You ended up leaving CIA over this issue. Yes. Uh, I was not opposed to the program itself. What, what changed for me was that uh, while I was the director of, counter of counterterrorism at CIA, in 2005, Senator McCain introduced what later became known as the McCain Amendment. And again, this is a very, very complicated issue, but, but the, the, the burden of that amendment, not in what was written, but in the legislative history behind it, indicated to us that CIA officers operating in good faith with uh, the, the full assurances from the Justice Department that what they were being asked to do was legal would not be able to rely on those legal assurances in subsequent years. And at that point, as the head of the Counterterrorism Center, these people who were engaged in interrogation were all working for me. I said, on that basis, we can't go ahead. These people have to have assurances that not only is what they are doing legal, that it will be considered legal in the future. Absent that, I said, we have to stop. You know, um, the, the last words of your book are, we may think we're finished with Afghanistan, but Afghanistan may not be finished with us. Yes. I hope you're wrong. So do I. We'll have to leave it at that. 88 Days to Kandahar, A CIA Diary is the name of the book. Robert Grenier, thanks so much for being on the program. You're very welcome. This has been the Mimi Gerga Show. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll tune again next time.